on this computer. And welcome to another session of the Teacher's Room, live from Los Angeles and uh, Osaka, Japan. Yay! <laughs> Tonight we have um, <clears throat> Joshua Sargent. It's been how many years, Joshua, since we saw each other? How was it? When did we graduate? In 2009? Nine, yeah. Wow, so it's, it's been like eight or nine years yeah because yeah, you you um you came you left japan a year or two after yeah. right yeah i left in 2010 so wow wow well i'm really happy that you volunteered to um do the inquisition <laughs> happy to share it with everybody um the one of the main ideas is that we have a, a range of people who are watching live sometimes and um watching it on youtube afterwards and it's just a real nice chance for people to listen to other people's stories. Um, I find them fascinating myself. I learn something from every teacher I talk to. Uh, feel free to go back and forth, um, but um, let's just uh, fill an hour of uh, sharing thoughts and ideas. All righty? So um, why don't you start with, um, uh, I guess, your teaching journey. When did you start teaching and uh, how did you end up in Japan and how did you get back and all that stuff? So take your time. I'll interrupt when I need more information. Go ahead. Um, so I was uh, born and grew up in the U.S. state of Maine. Uh, and I went to the University of Maine, Orono, uh, to study business. Well, I started studying horticulture and learned that um, I'm <laughs> bad at horticulture and it's boring. And so I quickly switched over to uh, business with an uh, emphasis in international and online marketing. And at the time, those were the same thing because it was a while ago. <laughs> um, and I liked marketing because it was about trying to understand people's motivations, trying to figure out why people behave the way they do, and also about packaging and presenting information in understandable ways that would mm. help them achieve goals. Um, and then I decided I would go abroad and get one year of experience in a foreign country to you know, boost up the international marketing side of it. And then the plan was to go back to probably Boston or someplace and be an international marketer. Mm. Uh, and the way that manifested was to uh, go to Japan for officially one year <laughs> to teach English for a big A Kaiwa. And- uh, were, were you, did you, did you know anything about Japan prior to that? Or like, how did you pick that country? I, I was a, a fairly serious martial artist um, when I was young. Um, so Japan and China were both sort of on my radar. And then my high school, I went to Kennebunk High School, um, which was uh, quite well off when George the First, or whatever we're calling him now, George Senior, <laughs> the first George Bush was president. Um, and so during that period, we taught like 10 different languages, and one of them was Japanese. So I took Japanese in high school and then took it again in college. So Japan was the choice between Japan or China. Um, and I was kind of like Japan. I was interested in the culture and I had some of the language. So I figured my one year abroad, <laughs> oh, my, my plan at the time, um, really just, I mean, once I was in the classroom, I just very quickly realized that everything I liked about marketing, I liked more about teaching. Oh, it's oh, my... I'm oh, sorry, I have to wave my arm so it's in a while to turn my yeah, lights on. Uh, <laughs> that happens in my bathroom at school as well. So I have yeah, to, I'm doing the same thing. California is all about energy efficiency these days. Yep, yep. Um, and you get exercise, getting up and turn the lights back on. No, but um, so, so that, that idea you said of everything you liked about marketing, you liked more in teaching, was that yeah. it being creating messages, persuading people? And that that side of it, I guess when I was a brand newbie teacher, that's really what it was. It was about how do I tell people things. Um, and then as I developed and grew and learned as a teacher and when you know, we started doing the masters together and all that, it, it became more about how do I understand people's motivations? How do I understand how people are learning and, and support learning? Mm -hmm. and I've, come to, I've come to the firm conclusion that there are far better ways to inspire learning than through teaching. Um, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that in a few. Oh minutes. right, sorry. Yeah, that's, I'm getting ahead of ourselves. Um, but yeah, that, I just I just completely fell in love with teaching, and and that was the end of the the marketing idea. I ended up staying in Japan. I think it was there nine years. Um, 
started off in Ekaiwa and then moved over to a, an Ekaiwa that was run by a university. So it was sort of Ekaiwa, but all the students were university students, but we weren't officially teachers. We weren't in the union. And then um, eventually I got asked to be the, the head of curriculum for a chain of Ekaiwa. So now I had 20,000 students and a thousand teachers I was overseeing. So mm. that was a big step up. Um, we wrote 20 textbooks in two and a half years. Yeah, um, I remember yeah. that time in your, your life, how busy that was. Yeah, you probably saw none of me. <laughs> That's yeah. Because yeah. we replaced the entire curriculum, threw the old one out, and then had yeah. to re-level, reassess every student, and then retrain every teacher. Hmm. And then uh, burned out and left Japan. <laughs> a little was it, it was pretty much burnout, was it? Yeah, it was that, and you know, my wife and I were, were considering having our first child, so we didn't really want to do that in Japan, so we moved to, she, she gave me the list of places that we could live. It was Honolulu, Guam, or Orange County, California, and so we moved to California. <laughs> <That's> easy. <laughs> wow. How scary was it going back to the States with um, the ability to flip burgers on <laughs> your uh, resume? Yeah, it was, I mean... I could teach, you know, so I had that, I had the master's, and I also had the business degree to fall into. So, you know, I, I had some options, um, but I ended up going to work pretty quickly for the federal government uh, as a teacher trainer, uh, faculty development specialist, as they call it, at the DOD. Um, and then I was doing very similar stuff to what I've been doing in my last job in Japan. It was about training and certifying teachers and helping build really workshop style curricula. Oh, uh, really? Uh, courses but building workshops and you know I, I for what kind of language learners so that was at a place called the defense language institute which is in monterey um that is where the u.s government specifically the department of defense so army navy uh air force marines coast guard cia um they if they need someone to know a foreign language they send them there so the students 99 percent of them are active duty military and then they Teachers are civilians, native speakers of whatever language the military finds important. How, about how many languages were you dealing with? I, I don't know how many DLI as a whole teaches, 20 some odd or more, but for us it was mostly, you know, the ones at the time that were strategically, strategically important. So Dari, Pashto, Urdu, Arabic, yep. uh, Korean, you know, sort of the standard set. Yep, yep. Um, but the teachers we were training, so they would hire, you know, a native speaker of Urdu. Um, and sometimes we got, you know, professors or linguists, you know, and then sometimes we got taxi drivers or farmers, you know. Yep, yep. As long as they had enough English to do the training and to live in the States, they could pass the background check and they were willing to move to the Monterey, California. They kind of took them. <laughs> so that was a real wild teaching experience because you'd have a room, you know, 16 student teachers, some of which have got 30 years of experience and doctorates, some of which were farmers two weeks yeah. ago. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was, that was a trip. Um, so I did that. Was that, was that very satisfying for you or just a grind? It was satisfying. It was, it felt really important just because, you know, these teachers would teach the language to people who needed that language to survive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so there was a lot of pressure from that, um, but it was it was really satisfying. It was good to see how quickly they could adapt to what we called modern teaching, you know, student centeredness and, and yep. communicative language teaching. Um, but you know, it was it was a lot of pressure and a lot of work. Um, was it um, was it very different, like corporate um, structure, court not structure, but corporate? What am I trying to the um, the feeling of working in Japan versus the feeling of working in the States, how culturally different was it? I think working in the States is culturally different, but working for the federal government is very similar to working in Japan. It's, oh. it's very much your bureaucratic base. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, there were things that really annoyed other Americans about, you know, we have to fill in this form and then it has to be done this way. I'm, I was totally used to that. I'm like, that's, that's the form. What do you, what do you mean? <laughs> where, where do I hanko? <laughs> exactly. Like, what, I don't understand the problem. <laughs> this is the form and we fill it out. You know? <laughs> it just, 
you know, I was I was inoculated to a lot of the frustrations of working for the government. Oh, that's so funny. Well done. Yeah, it worked out. Um, mm. But uh, I worked for the government as long as I could afford to, which is on my first day, my my, man, my, my new manager said, welcome to the federal government. Uh, please work here as long as you can afford to. <laughs> so that's what I did. Um, yeah. And now I'm down here at the University of Southern California at mm. the Research School of Education. Um, mm. Now I'm. The, well, what was the transition from the federal government? Then you did you take time off to do the EDD, or did you? I started the EDD when I still worked for the government. Yeah. Um, they were going to pay for it. <laughs> um, Good. And uh, they did for one semester, and then yeah. that program got cut. But um, you know, that was one of the difficulty things of working for the government is you never knew what was going to happen. And like I got furloughed twice and sequestered twice during my time there. Wow. And it was just one of those, like, I'll get paid this month if Congress gets along. But if Congress doesn't get along, I won't get paid. <laughs> so that was, yeah. I didn't have a strong sense of agency there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I took a little bit of time off, uh, just moved down here to LA. And then my wife had a job here, so we moved down here for that. And I started looking and I found USC was open and I'm quite happily here. So did you get in with the MA alone or did you get in? At that point, I was ABD, uh, all but dissertation. Um, I had finished all the coursework. Um, okay, so I they knew still, you were on your way. I actually started writing my first dissertation about a project I was doing with the military and then left the military, no longer had access to those students and had to start again. Oh. <laughs> so oh. I did a second lit review and a second methods. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. That was fun. So tell, I, I could, um, I, I wanna know a little, uh, can you answer a question about the, is it, did you say EDD or EBD? EDD, Educational EDD. Doctorate. Yeah, so the EDD, can you summarize that in under 40 minutes or? Yeah, I mean, the, the difference between EDD and a PhD. No, 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 I mean your topic. Oh, my topic, so, yeah. um, so my stream was called CTLL, which is Curriculum, Teaching, Learning, and Leadership. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of a sample of everything. Um, and then within that, I specialized in curriculum design and adult learning theory, or adult teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. um, and within that, um, and my dissertation involved, involved motivation and adult motivation. Uh, so that was sort of my, my sub-specialty. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And how long did you spend on that in total? Is that three, four years? Took, four? It took almost two years. Um, because I started the, my second dissertation, got into the lit review, and then, um, uh, then let's see. Oh, we had my first child, and also bought a house. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and then I, uh, a you very nice remodeling. Thing. I remember you remodeling online, and thinking, "Yeah, wow, he's got lots of extra time." Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were, um, yeah, there were, there were about eight months there where I. As my mother said, I built two bathrooms, a kitchen, and a, an entryway, and my wife made a purse. You know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I very naively thought, well, I'll be on paternity leave, and then, you know, four months later, I'll be ready to go back to work, but during that time, I'll get a lot of writing done, and, you know, it'll be great. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> so that, that didn't happen. Yeah, no, sure. So what's your, uh, describe your job. You, I was surprised when we first met because it's very early in the morning there and you said that you work seven to three basically to avoid all the traffic, which sounds very uh, flexible and wonderful. Is that sort of common in, in California that people yeah, are- Yeah, I mean, we try to be, I used to work six to two, but um, more people wanted to have meetings in the afternoon, so I moved it. Um, I'm, this is a staff position, not a faculty position, so okay. I do have some flexibility. I don't have regular classes that I'm teaching. Um, I'm the instructional designer for all non-degree programs. So if any of our uh, in-service stuff for add-on licenses for teachers who want to become reading specialists or uh, um, gifted specialists, or if they want to move up and get an administrative credential to become a principal, or 
if they're a principal and they want to move up to become uh, a chief business officer or a superintendent, you know, all of those involve add-on certifications and licenses. Hmm. So I'm designing all those programs, working wow. with the professors that Tom, you know, they're wow. going to teach it, but I design the course, design the curriculum, design the materials, and then often end up training the teacher on how to teach online because all of these are, are either online or blended. And so, wow. So yeah, it's it's a lot of work, but it's it's nice. I get to work on a bunch of different little projects and have my, my grubby little mitts all over a bunch of different courses. So yeah, absolutely. And and you have a uh, would you agree that your your mind is organizationally oriented? You're, you're a system oh, guy. No, no, I think I'm organizationally challenged. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, I, I work hard to stay minimally organized, but uh -huh. you know, we have. We have some really high quality office managers that come and, and so tell what, me what, what do you think you bring to that job in terms of your strengths? Um, I think I have a, a pretty solid understanding of curriculum design. Yeah. And I've done a lot of teacher training. So there's that. Um, technology skills, I think, are probably, yeah, I'm probably one of the better ones in, in the office just for instructional technology. Mm. And then you know, I've trained enough teachers that I can work with professors and get them new skills without offending them and, you yeah. know, making them yeah. feel like, oh, you silly old man, you can't use this, you know. <laughs> so, is there is there as big a range as I imagine there would be in, in the professors? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah I, have, I have literally taught somebody how to use email, you know, Outlook, <laughs> and then I've, I've got some that I can just say, you know, hey, I, I've set you up a sandbox in the LMS. Go play around with it and let me know if you have questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, my favorite was just to diverge for just a second. When I was at the high school, we had an old, old French teacher who came in, and every time there was the midterm or final, she would come up and pull the old typewriter off the top shelf. <laughs> and I decided to break down and teach her how to use the old square Macintosh that was in the nice. room. And when she realized that she could use the backspace button, she literally burst out <laughs> in Best invention ever. <laughs> because she had never conceived of the idea that she could just click that button and it would disappear because she had the, the whiteout and the, the mm -hmm. little whiteout tape thing going. Nice. That was my that was my best contribution to technology. <laughs> Mine was uh Last year, we had a professor who um, had had issued some reasonably regular essays to the, you know, these are master's students. Yep. And they were used to essays. Um, and then she sent me an email that said that she wasn't going to be able to correct all of the essays on time because her printer was out of paper. And so I, I texted her back. I'm like, um, how about you just correct them digitally, you know, because they send you Word docs and then, you know, there's track changes and you can, yeah. And then it, over the course of this conversation, it became clear that she believed if she didn't print out the documents, the students might still be editing them. Right. There you go. So somehow in her yeah. email inbox, they were going to be editing those. Yeah. I've, I've learned that anything conceivable <laughs> will in fact happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. I guess if somebody showed her a Google Docs at some point, and then sure. that sort of yeah threw her off. That copied and pasted to the wrong place. Yeah. So but yeah, that's that's my world. Yeah, I got it. That's it's it's interesting. Um, so you're not. Um, where, whereas, it went, how long has it been since you've been teaching language as such? I haven't taught language in the classroom since. 2005? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think about that, yeah. When I moved so, to, the, to be the curriculum designer for the Akawa, yeah. Yeah, so um, what percent would you say is designing curriculum versus training people to use curriculum? What, what, what percent is designing versus training? Because I'm trying to think which direction I'm going in next with questions. Uh, it really depends on the program and who we have teaching it. Um, right now, sort of the industry as a whole, one of the things that's happening is we're moving courses that used to be master's degrees into certificate programs. 
Um, people are becoming more and more interested in smaller, more tangible certifications, down yep. to, all the way down to badges. Yep. Um, you know, having a master's degree is no longer as exciting as having the four certifications of things that job offer, you know, people who have job really want, you know. Um, so we've moved a couple of our things. Our, our program that uh, is for people who want to become principals. Yep. You know, that used to be a master's. And because it's, it's a USC master's, it was, you know, whatever, $60,000 or something like that. Yep. Uh, now that it's a certificate program, we can do it for, I think it's like 10 grand now. Yep. Um, so m taking all those materials, you know, the materials exist and the professors are here. Um, but they're used to teaching it as a face-to-face, -face, and they're used to teaching it as a, a full-time master's. So there's a, that kind of program requires a lot of revision of materials at first. Yep. yep. But the teachers are generally easy to bring on board. You just sort of teach them how to teach online, and then they, they can generally go. Um, we have other programs that we're importing in uh, that were designed from the beginning to be online or, or hybrid. So those are, don't require as much right. vision, but we might be hiring fresh new adjuncts to teach it. And so then we have to get them to be, you know, I work with always, I always work with one subject matter expert or another, you know, it's, I don't know the things I'm supposed to be building. Right. So right. That whatever, whoever that subject matter expert is, and I work with those new faculty to get them on board with both the content and also the delivery and the, yep. the style of teaching that we want. Hmm. So you mentioned, I'm just about to launch here in Japan, um, a blended learning course uh, mm -hmm. for Japanese high school teachers. Oh. Uh, that still seems to be quite a, um, a mental challenge for them to uh, be open to um, working online. It's still a big, big jump for lots of people. Mm -hmm. um, one of my partners I'm working on it with, he uh, is working at an international high school and he's been doing this for a few years and they send out a fax. Do you remember that thing? They send out a fax to every high school in the say Kansai area mm -hmm. and uh, they'll get 50 teachers signed up within a week who want to come to this. But if you by don't send that fax, yeah, if you don't, yeah, by spam fax. So, um, that's what okay. we're going to be doing for step one, um, because that's where they're at, you know, and uh, um, so, so we, we have ahead. entirely moved to inbound marketing for all of our courses and we're having much that? better. Sorry? Can you explain that? Uh, yeah, so outbound marketing, it, it's a lot like teacher centeredness versus student centeredness. Outbound marketing is you sit down, you look at your, your widget. And you say, our widget is the lightest and the most durable widget in the world. And then you go out and you scream that from the rooftops to as many people as you possibly can. Yep. Uh, it's called outbound marketing. Okay. Inbound marketing is you sort of flip that and you say, let's find a group of people who are in desperately need, desperate need of something. They have a, a problem. They're whatever. Yep. They're... Well, in Japan, in Japan, they they have this problem that as of 2020, the university entrance tests are going to be four skills based. Okay. Just, yeah, there's the problem. So there's the problem. You then identify that group and, and any other group, um, and they're usually called cohorts or they're called yeah. personas. Um, and then you set up materials, usually online, that can help them, guide them through the process, and then help them solve their problem. Mm. Uh, and you don't necessarily ever mention your own product or your own service during this. It's just, hey, here's, here's what the new test is going to be. Here are what the four skills are. Here are some resources. And then some subset of the people who come to solve that problem, the way that they're going to solve that problem is they need a product like yours. Um, and then you can start talking about, well, here's our solution to the problem. So you don't get as many leads, but the leads you get are all pre-sorted. And they're all people who actually understand the problem and have decided they want a product like yours. Yeah. Um, and so they're, it, it's a very different style. And then the ones that you turn away, you know, A, they wouldn't have wanted your product anyway, and B, they leave having built a little bit of trust with you because they know that, hey, those, those guys over at USC or those guys, you know, they helped me solve my problem. They didn't try to sell me anything. You know, yeah. So you, 
build that relationship there too. So how's the um, how's the initial uh, awareness? How does the awareness take place uh, among all? In our case, all the high school teachers in in the Kyoto area who can, you know, come to our university easily or across Japan who might want to have us do something up in Tokyo, for instance. Yeah. So that is it's outreach. Uh, we use a lot of the digital marketing. Uh, email and we're in like the, uh, the direct the, the latest of direct mail kind of version yeah, of direct mail. yeah. And, and we're in um, professional trades LAUSD is the Los Angeles Unified School District that's the big you know union for all the school teachers in LA so we're they, they have a monthly publication you know we're there we're at conferences you know yeah. any place that we can just sort of raise people's awareness of uh, we're having a similar thing uh, to to move from teacher to principal, you need something called a preliminary administrative services credential. Okay. Um, you used to be able to just go and take the test, and then you had it. But now they're saying you have to have a uh, a preparation program, and then even if you take the preparation program, you still have to take the test. <laughs> so that's just a change that the federal government, the, the California government, has has uh, created. Uh, and so that's one of the big problems. And so one of our markets is teachers who are considering moving up into a leadership position, they want to know, hey, what's this test? What am I going to have to do? You know, so we are there just explaining what the new regulations are without even really talking about our program at that stage. We're there, the, the beginning of, of inbound marketing is really just there to help people figure out the world, figure out their problem, and solve their problem. And then if some of those people say, hey, I, I need to take a, a, a program, I don't need another master's degree and I want to do it online, <laughs> then we can say, hey, did you know that we have a program <laughs> that is online and is not a master's degree? <laughs> and then we also say, you know, UCLA has one too. You know? So it's, we're again, we're not pushing. It's soft sell. Yeah, we're just, just providing information and then the ones who are a good fit with our program will apply. Yeah, yeah. How much we, does the um, word of mouth play? Uh, does it play much into the what you offer? Or? Yeah, word of mouth is good, and then the USC name is, is a big seller yeah. around here. Yeah. Join the Trojan family. Yeah. Right. So, right. No, it, it's okay. You mentioned uh, quite a while ago now, but you mentioned something on leadership, and mm -hmm. uh, that my ears jumped up because that's um, a few years ago. I was teaching at um, Doshisha Women's College. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was on a regular direct teaching, preparing students to study abroad. And then they were considering keeping me on for another five years to have my own seminar with third and fourth year students. And they said, what's your, your area of study? And I said, uh, give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and then, I mean, my interest was in leadership training and sort of personal development. And so I got, I got into that and it's really blossomed for me personally um, in all kinds of ways. And, the, and I think it's something that young women um, can certainly take advantage of. But before I tell you any more about that, how, how does the leadership um, on your end, where, what kinds of things are you dealing with? So at, um, at Northeastern, is where I did my EDD, um, yeah. the CTLL covers a little, you know, they have core courses and then you choose electives based on your area of concentration. Yeah. And, and so I did not actually take the leadership <laughs> elective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but my understanding is that it is kind of aimed at like K-12 leadership, um, you know, becoming principal, superintendent, mentoring teachers and dealing with all the the budgetary issues dealing with the sure. school board dealing with pta and that so it didn't i'm not really a k-12 guy so it didn't no, really it just grab yeah um yeah. i have um there's so much on the the soft skills versus the hard skills oh, and yeah. the emotional intelligence and uh, uh knowing the difference between how men think in leadership and how women think and which kinds of leadership styles are effective. And it's just fascinating to me and the students grab onto it as well, because uh, we're, we're just at the point where I'm feeling like a lot of the students are serious when they say they want it all. 
Mm-hmm. They, they, they want to work and they want to have a family and they want to be given responsibility. And especially all these young women that I teach who've been abroad for a year. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and they've kind of seen that the world is a much um, wider place than, than what they've seen in Japan, of course. Yeah. 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 That sounds interesting. That's- yeah. So let's let's move into how are we doing? Oh, we're doing great. Um, let's move into um, a little bit about the training. I, I'm quite interested in that. And um, if if I were asking you about your theory of learning, I would be asking you how do you think people learn a language. But I'm I'm going to twist that a little bit into the training sector because I'm very about to do that with you know. Um, 50 Japanese teachers at a time, but um, what are some of the underlying tenets of um, how people learn in a training uh, situation that that come off the the top of your head? I mean, the biggest thing that we worked, that we had to tackle when doing teacher training, especially in service, Hmm. actually also pre-service too, is that unless people have really stopped and reflected on teaching and learning humans just default to assuming teaching happens like I've seen it happen before and so whatever way that they were taught is the default of (laughs) you know how that they teach you know and I've had yeah I had teachers especially a lot of the ones that we were training for when I was in the military I was military civilian um they were coming from you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, you know, and so it was a very teacher-centered, very high power distance. And I, I literally had teachers who would get a textbook and then just read it to a group of people and then have them repeat after them for the, the Arabic portions, you know? Yep. And, and I would say, well, you know, what's your learning objective for this lesson? And they would say, page 42 and page 43. You know? <laughs> I would say, well, What's your observable outcome? How how are you? How do you know if they've achieved your objectives? Oh well, I'll listen to them. You know, okay. <laughs> All right. Let's. What a, range, start again. Eh? what a range you must have been having to deal with. One of my students who went on to um, she went to India to do a master's. I think she got a scholarship. Is why she chose Southern India. And she said the first couple of weeks she was sitting in lectures by the Indian professor, and at 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 every sort of 10 to 15 minute interval, he would yell out to the hundred and some people in the room, am I right? And everybody in unison, yes, sir, you are right. <laughs> oh, well, then that, that's your question. That's using questions, right? <laughs> <The> comprehension checking. <laughs> yeah. I just said she started going. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we had to have that conversation a lot with teachers. Like, how do you know they're achieving your goals? Well, because I told them. Well, how do you know they were listening? Oh, because they're good students. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, and once we got them reflecting, you know, what was the best class you ever had? What was the best learning experience you ever had? Probably it's going to be outside a classroom in some cultures. Yeah. You know, when your your uncle taught you how to ride a bike, why was that good? You know. And, then we start to learn the, oh, well, I was, I was doing it, and then he was just watching me do it, and then he would give me advice if I asked for it, you know, and you start to tease out, you know, good questions, and it invariably becomes student-centeredness, uh, student yep. empowerment, yep. you know. and I'm a, I'm a self-determination theory guy, so I'm always going to talk about learner autonomy, learner yep. mastery, and learner, learner purpose, and so. But do you, do you find teachers feel guilty if they're not up teaching in front of oh, the yeah. i mean yeah, lecture yeah. lecture feels the most like teaching right yeah. i mean I, I always have to start with the idea that you know i think in a lot of people's minds teaching is like building a, a stone wall where you're like i've taught you unit one and now you're ready for unit two and then later we're going to come back and build on that and do unit seven you know and it's gonna yeah. and they slowly build up over time and i have to try to convince them that that no teaching is more like farming where you can't grow out, you can't go outside and like grow some corn, right? It's, it doesn't matter what you do. It's going to grow at its own rate. Yep. What you have to do is provide the optimal conditions to not hinder that growth. Yep. You have to, you know, farmers got to provide the right 
land and make sure they have the sunlight and the water and the fertilizer. And teachers have to provide the right atmosphere to inspire and to maintain that learning and really not get in its way. That's really yeah. most of good teaching is not interfering with your students' learning. Yeah, yeah. Just I mean, make... this is, we have a question here on, you know, sort of advice to new teachers, but you're nailing it right now, hey? I mean, did you, did it take you a while to learn that or did you pick that up oh, yeah. quickly? Oh, yeah. My first review when I was a new, brand new teacher, I, the, you know, the master teacher came in and observed my lesson. And I, you know, I had pulled out all the tricks. I had cards, I had games, I had dice. They were, you know, oh yeah, we were hardcore. Heads were spinning. Oh yeah, I was teaching the crap out of that lesson, you know. <laughs> and uh, his entire advice, he had just written across the top, shut up. <laughs> and I was, uh, that hurt at the time. But now I'm like, yeah, my advice would totally be shut up to that guy. <laughs> Because I realized that probably it was 80% me talking and, that, and you know, it was kind of worthless. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's my advice to a lot of new language teachers is just shut up. <laughs> yes. Stop. There's, a, there's um, a teacher um, here, Charles Adamson. He's retired now. But um, I was very lucky to go listen to him speak in Osaka one night. He's still on Facebook. He's a great guy. And... Um, he came up, he had this one liner that he used often in his presentations, but it was, when is teaching not teaching? And when is not teaching, teaching, you know? <laughs> Usually the second part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's that, just that concept of standing up in front, yapping away at people oh, is yeah. not teaching. And when yeah. you step back, shut up and get out of the way, that's actually when you're teaching a lot. Yeah, especially in a blended course, you can flip a blended classroom beautifully. If if you have a, a presentation or a lecture that you want to give, and it's going to be one directional communication, just record that. You know, that is a reading or a video masquerading as a class. Yeah. Just send it to them, right? Yeah. And they can stop, they can pause, they can rewind, they, you know, they can control it, they can do anything they want. Then when you have your live session, now that we're all here, we can do two-way communication. Let's do that, especially student-to-student yeah. -student communication. Yeah. You know, there's no reason for the teacher to be involved here, really. And so we can really maximize those live sessions and build the practice. Let's, let's think about what was in the lecture that you all watched at home. Let's apply it to your own context. Let's make meaning of it together and in groups. And I'm going to be here to facilitate and maybe answer questions, but I promise I'll shut up, you know. <laughs> that how many, is, uh, yeah, how many, uh, are you using breakout rooms oh, on yeah. the Adobe? Oh, of course. Yeah, so give me just a little run through in terms of uh, how long is a session, and then mm -hmm. you, obviously you start with everybody together, but just run me through just a, a, a mock. Yeah, so most of our sessions are 90 minutes to two hours, yep. um, depending on the course, and Usually we'll do something like a, a little 10 minutes at the beginning of, does anyone have any questions from the readings or the videos? Does anyone want to discuss something? Um, all of our courses have a, a little, we call it a parking lot, where they, any topics that come up, the teacher could just write them in that little area. And then we'll make sure we'll talk about those during the course and we'll check them off as we go. And if there's anything at the end of the, the unit that we haven't covered, we'll cover it then. Um, yeah. 10, 15, occasionally 20 minutes, but really that's, that's stretching it pretty long. Um, we try to break them into breakout rooms very quickly. I like to do groups of maybe four at most, um, and I make sure everyone in that group has an assigned role, right? So you're the summarizer, and okay. then you're the, the recorder, right? and you're the negotiator, and then you're the chair. Those are sort okay. of the four that we often will cover. Yep. Um, they will then make meaning of some portion of the reading, or sometimes it would be like, this group is doing reading one, this group is doing reading two, blah, blah, blah. Um, give them 20 minutes or so. Uh, teacher wandering between them to answer questions or facilitate any issues. And then bring them back into the main group. Um, <clears throat> another half hour to 40 minutes of just that, it, it's, you know, if it was a, like a proper jigsaw reading where only group one got reading one, then they're presenting the information. Otherwise, they're presenting the meaning they've made of it and leaving a discussion in the whole group 
about what meeting they have made from the first reading or the first video uh, so that the group can now come to a consensus and build that meaning and talk about their own applications in their own contexts. Yep. And then wow. We then will often move into small group work where they will then pro <coughs> excuse me, produce something uh, something tangible, something accessible, it's going to be a formative or a summative assessment. And it has to be something in their real world so that it's useful to them. And so usually, you know, if it's a session about, uh, one that I was working on yesterday, uh, Friday was um, how to use, it's a course about how to use social media in the school site. You know, what, what should a principal be putting on Facebook? Or how should they be using Twitter? That kind of thing. Yep. Um, and so the, the, the production there is, Go into your school, uh, your context, you know, go online, find and see if anyone in your school has already made a Facebook page, <laughs> find any standards you have, and then we're going to work on them and look at them, and, and you're going to think about how to apply what we just taught you to an actual context and produce a thing that your actual school can actually use. Uh, and that's generally the rest of the, the class. Wow. That's brilliant. It's, it, it, we're getting pretty good results. Yeah, we're about to run cohort uh, six and seven at the same time so you have so many people wow so. well, very cool how much you when you started talking about all that I, I started remembering our skype study group oh yeah you do you I remember, remember what do you remember from that just because i i remember a lot but just what do you remember from it in in broad strokes well i like that we we did it as almost a jigsaw reading right where one member each week was in charge of summarizing and, and connecting one reading to yeah. groups. And then we would all, again, build consensus and, and the connections between them all. I remember Mark had his whole thing about Bogatsky in it, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and that was, that was really useful for me because it gave me different perspectives on the same things that I was reading. Instead yeah. I was just I was going crazy on module one just for the audience when we did our masters uh, was kind of when Skype was kind of just getting going. Yeah, and, uh, I was driving we Google Hangouts at first, didn't we? No, was no, that... no, no, we went to Skype. Just Skype, okay. Yeah, but um, I I was driving my my wife and and the woman I worked with who sat across from me just as we are in two weeks within two weeks of module one readings. They both said, can you shut up? Because <laughs> I just needed, I had a, just a, you know, from the, the, the inside my toes, I had this need to discuss it and mm -hmm. chew on it. And, you know, right. and so I sent out emails to a bunch of people and got no responses. And then about the fourth or fifth time, there were like five or six of us who got together at the beginning. And yeah. uh, that was, was great. That was one of the best parts of of the masters was absolutely yeah. right? and then the the results um, when when we went on from our our averages on module one and then they skyrocketed in module two and onwards and uh, yeah. I just yeah, think that, that was, was yeah. um, sort of cutting edge for the time yeah as much as I hate the term we've established a community of practice at that point <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely wow yeah. um, so what um just to wrap up here, um, what kinds of things in uh, in both curriculum design, uh, in uh, training, in um, fathering, in home ownership, uh, just what kinds of things are you uh, interested in these days, both professionally and personally? Uh, I just want to remind the audience that your nickname was Einstein, wasn't it? No, no, that was Mark. You were you were um, Satan. I think I was Satan. Yes, you were Satan. Yes, and because uh, I asked the really probing, hard questions about connections between readings that no one had considered. You did. Got really me groans, and then like five or ten minutes later, would get me good answers. <laughs> Absolutely, no, you and and I, I kept telling you all through that you were you knew more things about more subjects than I could ever even list you know well, I remember that some of that was that I had two monitors so I could google things on the other monitor you could you could <laughs> yeah, I remember that setup uh, I remember it clearly and uh and we had Chris Kirsten Kirsten yeah Kirsten, Kirsten was Shakespeare yeah. yeah she would write 
you yeah. know, if it was a four page paper, she'd be like, well, I've written 10 pages and now I have to cut it down. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not able to pull the other guy's name out that we called Professor. Um, he lived out in Issei. Um, British guy, quiet. It was you, me, Mark, Kristen, yeah. uh, Kirsten, right? Yeah. That I kept calling Kristen the whole time. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Yeah. There was another guy. Okay, yeah, I've, I've forgotten yeah. the other guy now. Yeah, I'll get it. I'll wake up at three in the morning and text <laughs> you, okay? I'm so bad with names anyway. It's Yeah. I have coworkers I've worked with for four years that are three offices down that I have to struggle to remember their names sometimes. Right, right, right. Okay, so let's, uh, oh, oh, back uh, to the question. Things you're interested in. I'm fascinated. Oh, I'm, I'm primarily, professionally, I'm interested in uh, human motivation right now. Self-determination theory is kind of my jam. Um, my dissertation involves self-determination theory, and that's sort of... Can you, can you, for the layman, can you put that in a sen sentence? Uh, yeah, it's the concept that um, one of humans' primarily, uh, primary evolutionary advantages is that we are born curious about the world, we want to make connections and draw inferences from our surroundings, and we want to build connections with other people. Okay. And they call that intrinsic motivation. It's the yeah, default sure. state of human of the human brain. Yep. And to maintain that intrinsic motivation, you have to have three, we call them basic psychological needs. You have to have a sense of mastery or competence. So you have to feel like the tasks you're doing are achievable, that they're yeah. They're in that zone of proximal development, and also that you have the tools and the time that you need, uh, and that you know it's it's not impossible. It's also not boringly easy. Sure. Um, you have to have a sense of autonomy, um, and I don't mean that as a separation from others. I mean that as a, a perceived internal locus of control. So the idea is that that you can make some decisions, even if you're not able to choose what you do, you're able to choose how you do it. Yep. And that those decisions. Are, are real, they're not moot, and they have a direct impact about the likelihood of success of your mm. tasks. Mm. Um, and then you have to have a sense of, uh, some people call it purpose, some call it relatedness. It is basically the idea that you want to be the kind of person who does these things. Um, so if you're trying to learn how to play the flute, you want to become the kind of person who can play the flute. You want to talk to other flute players and join that community and build a connection with them. Yeah, and also sort of a sense of being on a team, and yeah. not wanting to let the other part of some. The way I've read that one is you want to be a part of something bigger, yeah, and that you're related to that group around you that has a bigger purpose or a bigger exactly, yeah. yeah. And so it can be sort of intangible. I want to be a member of the group of people in the world who are good people, yeah. <laughs> or it can be yeah. something real small like this is my, you know, again the military. This is my my fire team. These are the sure. four guys I'm with. You know. Um, and as teachers, we often just stamp all over those things <laughs> accidentally because we don't consider them. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll say, all right, kids, I want you to each, you know, I'm going to assign you a country and you're going to write a, a four page report about it. You know, and, well, why are you assigning them countries? Why don't you let them choose a country? Yep. They're killing their autonomy. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have until tomorrow. Oh, well, now you've not given them enough time. You've killed their sense of competence. <laughs> and then, you're all going to be competing against each other and only one of you is going to pass. You know, now you've just killed their sense of relatedness. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's my, my primary uh, professional interest. Yeah, that's my biggest professional interest right now. Wow. Um, you got any books in you? Do you think you can, uh, do, you, do you have a sense of wanting to write or not? Like a paper book? Like, like a snail mail book? <laughs> um, like, probably like, not. <laughs> like an ebook? Yeah, maybe I could. Yeah, I'm probably going to be building a series of online courses, uh, MOOCs. Um, yep. Probably going to be free, uh, yep. but I'm not sure. I haven't mm. decided how much time it's going to take me. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of thing. And and then um, you know, just publishing in journals is sort of my thing. Yeah. Um, yep. Personally, I'm interested. Uh, I, I'm in the early stages of joining. Uh, Founding a nonprofit organization called Body Integrity Alliance. Um, so that's about promoting the concept of bodily integrity across the world. The idea that each of us is born 
with a right to control our bodies and not to have them interfered with by others or the state or our parents or what have you. And so that's that's sort of my personal interest right now. And I'm doing a, a research project with my brother right now. Um, wow. That, so, yeah. And that goes both for men and women, for oh, yeah. sure, Absolutely. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 There's no, no gender bias in, in body yeah. integrity. That's, yeah. So... Okay, let me. Um, uh, I've got tons of other questions. I got. I'm trying to wrap, keep these to an hour. But let me. Um, let me close with um, your your lovely young daughter. I've watched every video you've put on there, and um, what kind? And and my kids are now 17 and 14, mm. and and I find myself having discussions with them about uh, the future and skills. They, you know, it's that that old idea about trying to to prepare yourself for a job that doesn't exist right uh, that whole that whole spiel what do you what do you see your daughter's what two now or yeah yeah what what do you see in 20 years from now do you have any uh, i'm not yeah i mean i'm not convinced that i i think there will still be universities and colleges but i don't think they will be nearly as important as they are right now yeah well um, isn't that i mean google and facebook and just said you don't need a university degree yeah. to join our company. And to me, that was the first big step. Yeah. Of, um, you know, acknowledging that people are not getting skills they need and, right. uh, and they're not really getting knowledge they need either. Awesome. At <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's going to get way smaller. It's going to be, if I need to hire somebody who can use Excel, can schedule appointments, can talk to customers, can wrangle a team, can chair meetings, you know, they're going to start seeing badges or, or smaller certifications about each of those things. Good. And then, then that's it. You know, the idea of badges like the, the boy scout kind of idea, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. So badging is, is one of the new things that's kind of hitting California. A lot of, is it? Uh, oh, yeah. I thought that was, that's not your term. That's, no, a, that's a new, yeah. Wow. And it's, it's, it's meant to be, sort of like if you do a MOOC you might get a badge you know it's like a little tiny certificate that isn't necessarily tied to seat hours it's tied to a demonstrable skill it's a competency-based assessment and and so how long like we at in my in our ITDI group um, we're doing these monthly they're called advanced skills courses so mm -hmm. right now Dorothy Zemak is doing one with us right now on self-publishing Mm -hmm. So we had 25 teachers come in with something they've written and they want to turn it into, a, you know, a, a, an online publication or, and so she's actually doing something very specific. And I guess that's a badge, but in your world, how long, how many hours or how many, how long does it take okay. to get a badge? Um, badges are not tied to hours. They're not tied to, to learning. Um, they're tied to just demonstrating a skill. So you can come in and, show us that you know how to do each of these things and you can get a badge for each of those things. It's wow. just, all wow. it is, is it's merit some, based. Yeah. It's, it's some authority quote unquote that is saying, you know, I have looked at a lesson plan that Steve made and he can make a PPP lesson plan. Yeah. And that's all it is. Full stop. I don't care where he learned it, how he learned it, how long it took him to learn it, whatever, you know, it's I badge just, you. Yes, exactly. Ha ha, you're bad. Do you know? <laughs> and, and that's all it is. And then you can shove that on a resume to say that, you know, Dr. Sarge says I can write a lesson plan. <laughs> Whatever. Wow. You know. Is that outside of California or just how, how old is this idea? I don't know. A year or two. We've been sort of dealing with them here. I don't think it's just California. Maybe U.S. wide. Yeah. Wow. It's, just been, it's, it's tied to the idea of MOOCs and the idea of just sort of boiling down a degree into its individually accessible competencies. Yep, sure, sure. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, do you have anything else you want to say about Emma's future? So you said you think colleges and universities might still be around? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're raising her bilingual, possibly trilingual, if you count Spanish. Um, so I think that is going to give her an advantage. Yeah. Um, other than that, I'm... I'm interested to see where she's going to go. You know, maybe oh, she'll too. maybe she'll stay in California. Maybe she'll be like, you know what, Peru is awesome. Who knows? <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. Then I, yeah. You know, I I grew up in Maine. I live now in California. My brother lives in Alaska. 
yep. my mother's in, uh, in Maine, but is considering going to Florida now, you know, yep. Yep. I think the idea, just like, you know, 20 years ago, people, maybe 50 years ago, people got a job with one company and then stayed at that company until retirement. I think the concept of, of being in one city or one town from education to retirement is also starting to go away. I think yep. it's getting much more mobile. Hmm. Do you feel like you could do your job at home or do you, do you have oh, a yeah. real, yeah. And is, is that yeah. ever a possibility? Yeah. Or? yeah. Yeah. I can do that once in a while. I come to the office if I have meetings or if I need some, I have some software here that I don't have at home. And yeah. You got to water your plants too. That's true. Well, right now we're, we're doing a lot of construction at the house, so I have to oversee that. So. Oh, cool. Cool. Well, this has been just way more fun than I could have imagined. Um, All right. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Yeah, pretty quick hour, huh? Yeah, it's true. I feel bad for keeping you up so late. Oh no, I'm I'm um, I'm. My problem is now I'm gonna get in bed and lay there and think about all the things I wanted to ask you, but I didn't. And then once I figure out that guy's name, I'm gonna send that to you in the middle of the yeah. night. I'm remembering that guy too now. Yeah, it's like Alan or Adam or or. Um, yeah. Oh. No, I was Willoughby. Thinking... Willoughby. Well, no, no, it wasn't Willoughby, was it? Wasn't there a Japanese guy too? Yes, there was a yeah, Japanese yeah, yeah. Taka. Uh, Taka. 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 Yeah, yeah, Taka. Yeah, he, Taka joined, joined, he joined late. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the other one was um, totally um, from the beginning. <laughs> the yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, yeah. Sorry, oh, whatever your name yep. is, buddy. Right. If you were in, if you were in Mash with us, yeah, yeah. So, keep in touch. If um, there's anything we can ever do together, that would be great fun. Yeah, yeah. Once I start building some of those online courses, the first one's going to be uh, effective presentations. I'm going to teach people how to use PowerPoint, mostly by not using PowerPoint. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So maybe we can we can do a little collab on it or something. I'd love to. Yeah, if you got an idea, let me know. Okay. Right. I just cool. I just started at um, Kyoto Notre Dame University, which is yeah, right in the city, yeah. and that's a tenured position finally. Oh, nice. Yeah, and so I'm there for the next ten years. Uh, I just turned fifty five this year, so I've got ten years left, and I'm I'm very much motivated to get stuff done. I only got a limited time. <laughs> I feel that it's really funny. I feel the clock ticking. Yeah, you know. yeah which uh, I hadn't until now yeah, 55. So. See, I just turned 40 and I'm motivated to go take a nap. <laughs> there, see? there you go. There you go. All righty. With that, um, I'll let you get back to work. And thank you so no, you much. You forgot to mention your own nickname in MASH. I did. It was Mother Hen. Yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I actually just wrote about that recently. I'm, I'm going to um, Korea, TESOL. I'm, I was invited as a featured speaker. It's all on fluency. And I, they asked me to write an article, and I wrote an article including our a little bit about our, our um, collaboration. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and at the very end of it, because I had introduced, you know, some, one was Shakespeare and one was... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Satan. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> And uh, and then I wrote at the very end, and by the way, I was Mother Hen. <laughs> well, you were a brilliant Mother Hen. You kept Thank us you. all in line and, and kept us all showing up. And yeah, and all those meetings was, were nice. It was so meaningful. Hey? What a meaningful learning experience that was. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right. Cheers, dude. Cheers. Go to bed. Bye-bye. I got work to do. All right. yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>